was genetic. Um, so they tested the entire litter again, and they found a very, 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 very small heart condition that was basically within the error bars of normal. And every vet I have taken that to since has been like, seriously? Seriously? But, but that was sort of spooking them. Um, there was a lot of paw licking going on, um, such that there was concerns about mild allergies, and that does seem to have come to fruition. That being said, he's a very licky dog. He licks his feet. He licks my feet. He licks the couch. He licks the blanket. He licks you. <laughs> he licks everything. It's like, is he licking because it's like itchy, or is he licking because he likes to lick? Who knows? Um, and then the third thing was um, when he was a puppy, a very young puppy, he had a chemical burn on his gums. He ate something um, scary. No one quite knows what happened there. Um, and so people, one of the vets freaked out and thought that like a tooth should be removed. And then I talked to the senior vet as part of the adoption. And they were like, yeah, but the gums and, you know, the, the tooth's in solid, you know, you know, fix it when there's a problem. Don't fix it when it's not a problem. And I have, again, since taken him to vets, and we actually went to look for the scar. And it's like this tiny, tiny, tiny little divot. Um, so it's like, oh yeah, I mean. So to some extent, if you really start looking for health, um, health problems in a being, you will find some. Um, so anyway, I was trying to talk about puppy raising and we keep going sidebar. Nope, it's fine. Um, we're like that. We're like that. This, <laughs> it goes that way every year. We like have yeah. this plan of like how to like lay out and tell the narrative in a coherent fashion and then we end up talking about whatever. Um, so anyway, um, there are schools that breed dogs. Um, you know, you can source your dog wherever you want, but um, a lot of the big schools um, have breeding programs. Um, and that's, you know, trying to do a lot of quality control and stuff like that. Fun fact, one of the reasons you see Labradors, um, Labradors are a really good breed for this, but you almost never see chocolate Labradors is because a lot of the breeding stock, um, that was not one of the things they were controlling for. There's three colors of Labradors. There's um, yellow, chocolate, and black. Um, and the chocolate gene, no one ever bothered to preserve it when they were breeding. So you pretty much only see yellow and black these days. It's not that the chocolate Labrador couldn't do it. Um, it's just that, like, especially in this school, um, that's just not a present gene anymore. It's just kind of wacky. They ha they got a couple of they got a litter with some chocolates in it a, a, few, a few months ago. Yeah. Oh nice. Yes. Yeah. Which I mean everybody was very surprised. <laughs> you know? Wow. Everybody's like excessive gene. Oh hey, look at that. Um, so if somebody somewhere has it, but they're not really trying for it or whatever. But there yeah. were a couple of there were a few chocolate labs that are. You know, everybody was very excited about it. I bet people like you know had slap fight to see who would get to raise. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh, I'd fight for one. Yeah. There's also a couple little, like some of them have a little brindle marking on them. But I mean, that's not a, that's not a, a that's not like a, a, a color color, but like, a, well, it sort of is. But they have a little bit, there's a few of them that have a few brindle, a few of the black labs that have a few brindle marks on them. Interesting. There's also one semi-famous puppy named Smudge. You remember Smudge? Oh, no, I don't think I remember. Okay, so Smudge was one of the ones that, my, our guide dog school has a um, partnership with the Dodo. Anyone watch the Dodo on, 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 online where they have eight zillion animal videos? And I don't know what else they do, but eight zillion animal videos. And so they were watching this one particular puppy grow up, and her name was Smudge, so called because she had a birthmark, uh -huh. um, which is basically a smudge of black on a yellow lab. And she, she's adorable. She wound up also flunking out for health-related reasons, but like Smudge was pretty famous for a while, and I, I got, I got very excited watching Smudge videos and trying to see how she was, um, if she, if she was going to make it as a guide dog, which did not wind up happening. But I, she's five now, and she's doing real well. Cool. Okay, I stand corrected on the no, it's cool. situation. No, no, that's it's generally they're black, they're yellow. That's what you got. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when they're born um there's you know the whelping center and stuff like that um and the dogs are basically set up for success from day one um that they're going to be working dogs um until about two months old and that's when they're ready to go out and be placed with puppy raisers um the raising phase um usually you know kind of depends on how fast the dog is progressing but you generally have them for about a year um you're doing all the toilet training um you're doing all the um, exposure tasks to 
to various people and situations and stuff like that. You're teaching various um, commands, making sure those commands work in different situations. Um, and then after a year, they um, go in for training. IFT is what it's called. Um, and that is basically, they have graduated to, um, to service dog college. They go back to the home office um, and they learn their advanced skills. So the dogs that I was working with, so um, there's two organizations that are sister organizations. There's the Guide Dog Foundation who does the, um, the guide dogs. Um, so that is blind assistance. Um, and um, they use full-time puppy raisers in the sense that they, these puppies are placed with a family and you are doing all the raising and all of the care yourself. Um, the guide, um, the America's Vet Dogs is their sister organization and they mostly do service dogs for um, veterans and first responders. Um, and they specialize those dogs uh, to injuries common to those, that demographic. So um, PTSD, um, mobility support, um, deafness support, um, a couple other things, I forgot, general assistance, wheelchair stuff, yeah. um, and frequently combinations of those because if you are in a big traumatic injury causing um, incident, it is likely that that affected your hearing and probably your emotional well-being as well. Um, I have worked with, uh, oh, and this is the other key thing, the other big thing with those is that organization um, is partnered with a prison puppy program. So um, my dogs that I worked with, um, they lived at MCI Shirley, um, Massachusetts Correctional Institution um, in Shirley, Massachusetts. That's where they lived during the week. They lived with inmates um, who were their primary trainers. Um, they learned most of their commands and stuff from them. And then every Friday, I would pick them up, generally the same dog unless something weird was going on. Um, and basically, I got to do all the fun stuff. Um, I got to take the dog around and see how all this training held up in different situations. So I would take them to the restaurants, and I'd take them on the subway, and I'd take them on buses, um, and they would have to deal with, you know, fire trucks going by, and little kids running by, and scooters, and bicycles, and grass. Grass was something they were not really super exposed to. Um, children, they were not super exposed to. It was a men's prison, so women weren't around. Um, and it's interesting the kinds of things that dogs can tweak on, um, and it's not always the same thing. Um, so they give you a long list of things that you're trying to sort of expose them to in various outings. Um, and then we would do that, and some weekends there would be a training, a formal training with um, his co their cohorts. So like five service dogs all going somewhere. Um, and then on Sundays I would return them. And we have a question. What does it take for a puppy to fail the training? Like you mentioned different um, situations where they didn't do well. Mm -hmm. How do they fail? Like how, not how bad do they need to do? Because they're all good dogs, I'm, I know. But like, what what needs to happen? Where, when is it considered like we can't fix this? Um, just to repeat the question, what does it take for a doggy to flunk out? They're all good dogs, but what does it take for them to be like, yeah, this isn't gonna work? Yeah. So um, I have raised twice, and they have both. <laughs> they have both been released. They have both been career changed, and they were both for different reasons. Um, so there's um, the first one I had, her name was Mary. Um, she was part of a December litter, so they all had wintry um, sorts of names. Um, my joke is if I ever ended up adopting her, I was then going to get her like a little friend named Pippin, and we would go in that <laughs> direction with it. Um, but um, she was a fantastic black Labrador, um, and she was just not thriving as a working dog. Um, she would try so hard, um, but she was very anxious, um, you know, so she could do the work, but she was kind of miserable the entire time, and that started to manifest in poor behaviors, um, tenseness in her body. Um, this was my first time raising as well, so um, when I saw her tail wagging, I thought she was fine, but it turns out that there's a very low wag, which is actually a sign of nervousness, and that's what she was trying to communicate. Um, and she like pretty much just wanted to stay home and snuggle me because she just was having trouble. Um, I sometimes wonder if she'd actually gone the guide dog route, she might have thrived a little more because she needed, she just needed some more stability in her life. Um, and I think the fact that she was changing households every week 
was really trying for her. My joke was, when I was talking to the trainer, because we were having all these problems, her separation anxiety was huge, um, and worked really hard at trying to fix it, but yeah, it was just not coming. Um, that like Friday Mary and Sunday Mary were two different dogs. Like Friday, she was just a basket case, um, and just needed to be with me. And then by Sunday, she was like the doggy works kind of expecting. She had relaxed by then. She was like giving kisses and meeting people and just much more relaxed with everything. Um, and um, the day that I kind of realized that like this was just not her destiny um, is I was, um, so she would do this thing where she could work, but she was staring at me the entire time. She had it dialed up to 11 the entire time she was working. Um, and um, I was sitting at the, you know, sitting at my dining table and having lunch. Um, and she was just laying down by my feet like she was supposed to. We were practicing the under command, which is, you know, sit politely under this table while I eat. And, and um, she had, I didn't even give her the command. She just went and did it because she knew that was the deal. And she was like lying down and she was perfectly calm. I went up to get something. She followed me, came back, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to make it work. And so I actually told her under. Um, so now, rather than just settling at my feet, she is now working because she's doing everything I asked her to do. And so she did it, but she was staring at me the whole time. And like I sat there for a good half hour and she never relaxed. Um, so yeah, that was for me sort of the moment of like, okay, I really don't think this is going to work. And I was in communication with the trainer and like we give reports all the time and um, also, you know, her anxiety was causing other problematic behaviors, like she would relieve on walks. And um, relieving only on command is one of the big deals that you have to do for a service dog. And she was like relieving, having accidents in houses and in buildings and stuff like that. It was just not good. So finally they got back to me and they were like, yeah, we're gonna release her from the program. When that happens, um, for this particular school, Razor gets right of first refusal. I could have adopted her if I wished. Um, as it was, my home was one of the environments that was setting her off. So while it broke my heart to do so, I decided to decline. Um, and I have since, I have since moved to a place that would have worked much better for her. But um, there are, there is a line of a bazillion people who want these flunked dogs. Um, so never worry about a dog who's been released. Um, and if you ever want an amazing dog, um, get yourself on that list. <laughs> and it will take years, but you will get such a good dog. Um, but anyway, yeah, she did get released. She got um, adopted by someone out in Sag Harbor um, in Long Island. She's got a big sister um, dog, so she's never alone. Um, they work from home. Um, I've seen pictures of her going on walks next to yachts. She's going to re she retired better than I'm going to. <laughs> she's like, and also I was really happy to hear a lot of her anxiety behaviors went away. All that really severe separation anxiety she used to have. Once things just got stable for her and her expectations were not as high. Um, so she you know, really told us that this was not her destiny. Um, for Ryan, that's a completely different situation. Um, Ryan was being geared for PTSD support. And I think he would have been fantastic at it. He's a very chill dog. Um, he just sort of sits there. He's got like this crazy little wiggle, wiggle walk. He mows these along. Most dogs, you're like, when you try and get them to heal, they're trying to pull ahead. Him, you have to speed him up. Um, <laughs> but like, these aren't big deals because, you know, he would just be placed with someone who also had a slow gait. You know, there's lots of different kinds of people in the world. You just make sure that they're matched well. And Rachel can talk about what it means to be matched to a dog in a bit. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, he had these medical, so he went all the way to IFT. He actually got sent away and I was like, ah, um, and I was very sad about it. And um, then he got sent back to Long Island to the headquarters and then I got a call saying that they were gonna release him for medical reasons. And talked to the vet and they were like, <laughs> there's this like um, very pragmatic um, old vet who's like in charge of the vet pro yes. program yeah. there. And she was like, this is the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> this is a good dog. And he could absolutely work. <laughs> um, 
but that's what they've decided. So I get to keep the dog, and I'm like, I'm going to adopt him, yes. And she said, congratulations, you've disappointed many people. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, like half the staff had fallen in love with Ryan, and he never would have made it to that mailing list because someone was going to take him home. Yeah. But, yeah, he's living the sweet, sweet pet life these days. Um, you know, he's, um, he's running around and begging for food for everyone and convincing everyone he is the best ever, because um, he is. Um, and... Um, yeah, he has recently become officially my emerg my emotional support animal. Um, I hadn't really worried about the paperwork before because the main thing you get from something like that is um, um, the ability to bring him into an apartment um, and things like that. It's a housing thing, and I own my own home, so like, what was the point of like bothering to get a letter? But it also turns out again, wacky American things. Um, if you have an emotional support animal, you can also use your um, FSA and H your health savings accounts um, on their care. Um, and that actually turned out to be a fairly good tax benefit. So, <laughs> good to know. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was feeling like, oh, this feels cheesy. Oh, maybe I shouldn't do it. And then, like, I think someone pointed out, like, it's there's this um, false scarcity rhetoric yep. where, um, you know, it's like where you try not to take a thing because you feel like by to doing the thing you are. Um, taking it away from someone else, and they were like, seriously, woman, this is taxes. <laughs> You're just doing different math on your taxes. You are not causing someone else to, who needs it more than you to not be able to do their thing because you're doing the thing. Um, and we have a question. Yeah, um, cycling, uh, circling back to, uh, you were talking about Mary, how she was assigned a specific service. Are puppies generally assigned to a specific service line, or is it possible for them to switch at some point? Are puppies generally assigned to a specific service line, or is it possible for them to switch? So it is possible for them to switch, but it's very unusual. Um, so um, since they are different programs, um, and they do, um, guide dogs have some very specific needs. The one or two times I've seen it done is guide dog going to service, not the other, the other direction. And that's because there's a couple of wacky things that very specific needs for guide dogs that you really need to like start right at the beginning. Um, and um, yeah, there was, a, there was a poodle actually that they were really trying to. Um, so yeah, so in terms of breeds, um, the- I want to know which poodle. Um, what's it's her okay. name? It's um, okay. Yeah, yeah, they were released, it didn't work. Um, but, um, yeah, so at this organization, so first of all, there's just a matter of physically what, what program needs more dogs um, and what programs can take more dogs who's got risers and stuff like that. So there's some of that logistical stuff. Like, I don't think they looked at Mary and they were like, yes, you would be a better service dog than you would be a guide dog because she's like this tiny little ball of fluff, who knows. Um, they do that now. I think they do some temperament testing. Now. They do? Yeah. I cool. think they do temperament testing on, now, I don't know how accurate that stuff is, you know, it's like, it's like looking at a baby chicken and saying, yup, this is definitely not a rooster. You have no idea. <laughs> but like, you know, like I, they, they do a thing. I don't know what it is when they're like, I don't know, eight weeks old and they do a thing. Okay. So this also might be a good time to turn it over to Rachel because she can actually talk about some of the special needs, intelligent disobedience and, yeah. um, Lack of eye contact um, are the two things that guide dogs really need to do that service dogs don't. Right, right, yes. So, uh, so a couple things. One, the uh, one place where there is crossover is um, there are blind veterans, <laughs> yes. and so and they technically are counted as graduating through the America's Vet Dog Program, but they come in with the guide dog class. And um, if you are a blind veteran, you probably also have some of these other needs. So that is something where cross training definitely has been has been known to happen. Um, the in in terms of I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Echo does and in that get to the intelligent disobedience and all that. So Echo is my guide dog, um, and I put my life in her paws every day. Um, and uh, as you can see, she's working very hard now. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, like I said, my CNA ain't so good. So, um, she gets me from point A to point B without, you know, getting dead. And, um, she, uh, she leads me around obstacles. Um, she actually can remember 
points of interest. I showed her where my room was once, and if I tell her to find the room, she will do it. Um, and in fact, she found better routes to the room than I knew about, so maybe I should trust the professional. <laughs> um, and uh, she can, uh, she, she remembers, you know, she remembers specific routes. Um, I can name something and tell her to find it again. Uh, she knows what a trash can is, you know, she knows she can find an empty seat in a crowded room or on a bus, which makes her worth her weight in gold, because God knows I can't find those things. Every now and then, the guide dog will, you'll get on the bus and the driver won't be on yet, and they will find you the driver's seat that is less helpful, but you said find a seat, you know. Um, they, uh... I think she technically knows find a stall, but she doesn't know find a clean stall, so I never use that. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, and you know, dogs are gross, so like we don't, we don't. Um, she can help me get across the street. She cannot tell what the light is doing, but I need to be trained well enough. I have to have orientation and mobility training in order to be even accepted to guide dog school um, to be able to get around. Um, and so I tell her when I think it's time to go, or to, to cross the street, and she tells me if that is a terrible idea. Um, and so this is where we get into intelligent disobedience. If I give her a command that it would be dangerous to follow, she will refuse to follow it. So let's say I'm standing at the top of, let's say I'm standing at the platform, uh, at the edge of the platform at the subway, the T, but the subway, for those of you who are not mass holes. Not Boston. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, anyway, but let's say I think I'm at the top of some stairs and I tell her forward. She will not go forward. And I keep telling her, come on, forward, forward. She won't. And she will probably curl around me and block me from going. Um, if we are crossing a street, and it was originally a good idea to cross, but people are driving like they do in Boston, <laughs> and they come out of frickin' nowhere. Um, they're not actually out to kill you. They don't know you're there. Um, and uh, so they come out of frickin' nowhere. She is trained to either speed up, slow down, or stop me to get me out of the line of danger. Right? She, she, they do what is called traffic checks, which is if a car suddenly comes out of nowhere and is about to hit you, they will stop on a dime, and they will stop you on a dime. And, um, and those do happen, more than we would like. Um, also, in training, we practice traffic checks. There are a few trainers for whom this is their favorite part where they get to drive cars at us. <laughs> Some of them get a little too excited about that. <laughs> Um, and the, actually the bigger schools these days also have invested in an electric, uh, well, uh, a hybrid car because those are quiet. Um, quiet cars have, become, have been a really big problem for blind people trying to navigate because we can't hear them coming. Uh, and we can't adjust accordingly. And I, with all due respect for those of you who drive, some of you are not good at adjusting accordingly about us. So, um, anyway. So she will stop. In an extreme situation, she would probably take the hit, God forbid. Um, let us never have that happen, but there have been dogs who have done that. Um, please drive carefully. Yeah. We have a hand raised. Yes. A dinosaur would like to ask a question. Hello, dinosaur. But don't dogs have great hearing? They do. Dogs have fantastic hearing. They have really good hearing. But if the car, if the... If the Prius or whatever is is not actually making any noise, there ain't nothing to hear, and that is one of the thing about the uh, things about the the um, you know the electric cars and the hybrid cars is that they were specifically designed to be really really quiet, um, which means they don't make much noise. Nowadays, there are now rules saying that these cars have to make some noise, so. Um, Actually, one of my one of my friends who's on this who's on this boat, she has a Tesla, and it makes you can pick the noise that it makes, so it sounds like a spaceship. All the <laughs> when she's driving down the street, it will also make the ice cream truck noise. Don't don't, don't do that to people. 
It, yeah, it, that just seems mean. Because like I it is, yeah, it is mean. Um, also, sometimes your partner comes downstairs. One of your partners comes downstairs and is like, "Who the hell's playing turkey in the straw out there?" So yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, anyway, she she uh, can find a sidewalk. She can find the door. She can find. This is particularly useful because in bright light, I am significantly more blind. I have extreme light sensitivity. I hate light. Um, it is, I, for some reason, it is frowned upon to put a bag over your head and walk around, or I would totally do it. Um, Built in mask. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, like, just, you know, but the, um, but what that means is that I walk out, if I walk out of a building and the sun hits me right in the eye, she's got me. Right, and she will take me where I, where I need to go. Um, so she, she also, she takes me around obstacles and they also know about overhead obstacles, which I will say canes are great, but they don't know nothing about overhead obstacles. And, um, she, um, and to their credit, canes don't poop. So, you know, it, um, but, uh, it's pretty funny because my last dog, his trainer at school was six foot five and I am five foot two and that uh, Salem led me around obstacles. I have no idea what they were. They were in the sky somewhere. <laughs> I have no idea. But like, and one of the things that people have been known to say about dogs versus canes is that a cane will tell you more about your environment, right? Because you have to do more exploring. Whereas the dog will take you right past whatever the obstacle was or the whatever the environmental uh, thing was, and that is cool. Um, I don't actually need to know that much about the thing I didn't trip over, so I'm good. <laughs> Um, but yeah, she's a good kid. Um, so yeah, the intelligent disobedience, what was the other thing? Oh, the eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact, yeah. So um, actually, this is something I learned from Marley, is that apparently the, uh, the, the, the service dogs that, you know, do more, um, that, that do not do the guide dog work, do a lot of stuff around eye contact, around making eye contact, especially if they're like, interrupting a PTSD episode, if they're helping with anxiety, if they're doing that sort of thing, like, or if you're giving them a command, like my coworker at work, we are, at, my office is a two dog, two person office, and Echo's coworker there is a hearing dog. And so, like, she is all about the eye contact. Tessa will, you know, Tessa will make eye contact with her handler, and I, I hear eye contact is a thing. <laughs> it, it's exhausting for me to try to fake it, so I don't a lot of the time. But, like, the other thing is that people are constantly trying to make eye contact with my dog. She does not require eye contact from me for what are probably obvious reasons. But also, like, you don't... She's pretty good at ignoring other people's eye contact because people will try to do that. People will try to... Um, interrupt her work because she is adorable and so people will be like I can't help myself I just gotta pet you and I'm just like I didn't throw you under a truck yeah. um, because that's essentially it right like I'm trying to go from place to place without injury and so like you know you cannot do your job when someone is petting you <laughs> and if that's your job that's your business <laughs> but like you know if somebody is petting you and it is not part of the arranged work, then you cannot do your job that way. Neither can she. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so one of the basic, one of the very first commands we teach a service dog is to respond to their name with eye contact. Um, and actually, this is a good question. So Rachel, um, if you need, if you need to know that um, your guide dog is paying attention to you, what do you do? Well, I do call her. Um, you know, I might give her a command, like sit or whatever, just to make sure she's, uh, she's responding, heal, okay. whatever, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, and you feel that she's doing it through the harness? Or? Yeah, yeah, or through the, through the leash or whatever, but also, like, yeah, um, also you can hear, uh, the great thing about the collars is you can hear them move, <laughs> um, and so they, uh, I have actually been, <laughs> In the, in the cabin when we're sleeping, because it's close quarters, 
and because her food and water are right there and I don't want her to go jangle, 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 jangle all night. I've been taking off her collar at night when we go to sleep, but then I don't know where she is because <laughs> she's a black dog and it's dark. And uh, she actually has figured out that I cannot see her in the dark. And so when I, she's out in the yard and I, at home and I call her and she doesn't feel like coming back in, she will stand perfectly still in the shadows and I will have no idea where she is because oh, she's, she's a, a little brat. brat. Oh, she's a brat. <laughs> oh, if you have a poodle, you have to be ready to, be, to, you have to be ready to be humbled every day because they are smarter than you. No matter, I don't care how smart you are. Like the, the, the dog's smarter than you are. We've had two raised hands. Um, here first. Uh, how long do guide dogs serve for before they retire? How long do guide dogs serve for before they retire? So like many of these questions that is answered with that depends. Um, my first dog Brody, who is this tattoo on my arm, um, Brody worked for about seven years. On average guide dogs in the city work about seven years, guide dogs in the country work about nine. That's an average um, Salem worked for three because and he did excellent work, but we were attacked twice by off-leash dogs. Please leash your little darlings. I don't care what you think they wouldn't do. If you're not going to leash your little darlings, please preemptively donate $50,000 to the guide dog school of your choice to replace whatever dog you ruined. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, two different times we were attacked by off-leash dogs and he became reactive and I can't really argue with him for that and you can't work a dog like that. So he is living happily with some friends, friends of ours, and um, he, uh, he's doing great, but he's not working. He stopped working at five, which is, I mean, that's not great for their investment, first of all. Um, and one of the cool, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this, uh, finish answering in a second, but one of the cool things about having, the, the guide dog school has relationships with other kinds of programs. And so for example, if a dog flunks out for being too sniffy, ATF is dying for bomb dog for, and for, for like whatever sniffing dogs. And so like a lot of these dogs that it, you play to their strengths, right? So if the dog is too sniffy, they may have another job available for them working for another agency. And that's, that's pretty cool, right? You know, like they, they, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly a tragedy if a dog becomes a beloved pet, but if you've been doing all this training and investing and, and, and they could be happy working. And that's the thing, as, as Marley pointed out, you cannot make these dogs work if they don't want to. People have come up to me and been like, you're forcing the dog to work. I can't force this dog to do anything. <laughs> um, they don't work if they don't want to work. And I think that's the other thing is when they're done, they let you know. Um, when they are, when, when they are, you know, Brody, my first dog, we knew she was ready ready to retire because she started kind of phoning it in and you can't phone this job in. Um, and, um, you know, she will let me know when she's ready to retire. And much as I joke about her working forever and ever, that day is closer than I like to think about. Um, and so that's, yeah, it, it really does depend. Sometimes there, and so, sometimes, you know, like the rest of us, as you get older, they don't, the, the parts don't work as well. So like, you know, eventually if the dog is having trouble seeing or hearing, then that is something where, you know, even if they really want to work, you need to retire them. Um, nobody tells you to retire them, but they might politely suggest it. Okay, we have another question from the dinosaur and then we'll go to the person in the back. Okay. What does the command heal mean? Heal means basically, um, okay. In the context of our dogs, because I cannot, like, what you teach your dog is whatever you teach your dog, but it means they, they come up around side and, you know, are nicely aligned, walking in, walking in nice leash right next to me. Um, so, like, she's not healing right now. Oh. I didn't tell her to, so she's good, but um, if I told her to get up and do that, she would move around side me in a particular position. Another, um, it's related to a skill called loose leash walking, yes. which means that, um, yeah, while you're holding the dog's leash, it is always, um, always bowed. There's no tension on it. The dog is keeping place next to you. Um, and in fact, you know, you've got the heel command down really great when you can do it with no leash or anything on the dog. You just tell them the heel and they're um, right by your, right by your left side and just keep, keep pace with you. 
and one of the trainings that we do is things like, and then I'll speed up, and then I'll slow down, and see if they actually do that, um, they're paying attention. And we have a question in the back, with someone with a mustache on their mask. Oh, I apologize if you already said this, but I was just wondering about how much of the day the dogs tend to be kind of on duty and working versus off duty and could you repeat? We have not answered that question already. Um, how much of the day does the dog tend to be on duty and working versus off duty and just chilling? Oh, and that's a different answer depending on what kind. Of that's exactly right. It <laughs> really depends on the work they're doing. And this is something that has actually come up in my office. Because when she's in my office and she got me there, like right now she's on duty. She's got her, I mean, we're not going anywhere. But when we get to my office, Usually I just let her like hang out in the office, right? I take the harness off and I let her, let her. not everybody chooses to do that, but I, I do. Except she's got a coworker. And the coworker does not get to do that because she is a hearing dog. And so she has to listen for sounds even if they're not in the process of going anywhere. So she's on duty all the time. So this girl, because she's a little instigator, <laughs> Um, winds up on tie down a lot of the time in my office because otherwise she is up in the other dog's grill trying to be besties and Tessa needs to, and Tessa will get in trouble for not paying attention to her job, um, which is an important job. So like the, the fair thing for me to do is make sure she's not bothering Tessa because otherwise she totally will. They would love to be best friends, but we don't really let them play together because it would be furry chaos in the office. And we want, we, de we definitely want them to be able to be on duty when they need to be on duty. And in Tessa's case, that is most of the time. Um, they have commands or gear or whatever, depending on what they're doing, that tells them when they're on duty. So she knows she is wearing her harness and she is on duty and she is not running up and saying hello to everybody. Um, but uh, and her friend, Tessa, has a, I'll have to tell, I'll have to tell, my coworker that Tessa is famous, um, it, it has a command that she could be given, say hello, right? So it depends. When we're hanging out at home, when we're hanging out in, in our cabin or whatever, she's just hanging out. But my, my coworker, when she goes home, she, the dog is always at least a little bit, like if they're all asleep and the fire alarm goes off, um, you know, my coworker has taken out her cochlear, uh, her, her, she's taken her ears off at that point. She's completely deaf at that point, and she doesn't, like, know that anything is going off, so Tessa has to wake, uh, has to wake up and do the alerting. Um, you know, does that mean she can't take a nap? She can totally take a nap. She just has to be able to be on the job when she needs to. Yeah, so the service dogs, yeah, there's a, um, it's, yeah, it's much more fluid. Um, yeah. It's not like there's a harness that goes on and, you know, yeah. the harness is how she does her job. So it's like that's a really obvious signal. Right. Um, but, you know, especially if you're doing any sort of alerting tasks, um, you know, you need to be always paying attention to that. And sometimes, you know, there are commands that you give. And like, so, you know, there's the commands which are like, we're just hanging out. But also if I say, you know, brace or something like that, because I'm, you know, we've been hanging out in the living room, but now I need to stand up and I need something to brace against. So the dog comes and um, strikes a power pose so that you can um, use their um, their back as leverage to help yourself up. Um, you know, so you, as long as the dog, the dog always needs to respond to commands and be able to, uh, aware of alerts. But a lot of that is done in a very casual kind of way. You know, there's there's the say hello command, which is basically you have permission to go love on this person in front of you within reason, um, and then come back. Um, and then there's free, which is you know. Yeah. With, Free is basically the equivalent of taking off the harness, you know. Of course, there are behaviors that you're never allowed to do, but for the most part, you can go sniff around and do what you want to do, you know, go hang out. And we have another question. Yeah, when you started um, going on cruises, was there any specific behaviors you trained, like, in order to be on a cruise with your dog? That is an excellent question. When I started going on cruises, were there any specific behaviors I trained in order to be on a cruise? Holy Yes. I would guess. <laughs> so, kind of. First of all, <laughs> she has to be willing to pee in a box on deck three. <laughs> um, and that took some doing. Like, she's been trained on a number of different surfaces. They actually train them to go on concrete if necessary because not everybody lives near grass. 
and you, you have to be able to relieve your dog even if you live in the heart of New York City or wherever. Um, she certainly has preferences. Um, so the first time she, the first time we were on a cruise together, it was not a Joko cruise, and we had this, we had this box and it was a different cruise line, it was at, on our balcony for, or for and, and she didn't poop for four days. Aww. And I kept bringing her over there, but this is where you do it, kid. Like, right, you know, and, the, um, and whenever we went ashore, she was just like, oh, thank God, you know. And so she, she, but there were a few sea days in a row and she kind of exploded at the end of them and I felt so bad, but I was like, you know, choices were made here, kid. Um, but yeah, so she is much better now. She walks right up to the thing and goes, um, she has been on boats, albeit she had been on boats, albeit not cruise ships before. She loves the beach. Um, she one of the cool things about about the the guide dog training and the service dog training is that they are they are trained basically they are conditioned to respond to difference to change with curiosity rather than fear. And so it's it's pretty cool. Like even if it's something she hasn't handled before, she's got this. You know, that's basically her mindset is that she's got this. And they are exposed from from little baby, baby, baby puppyhood to new and different textures and sounds and things like that, and then rewarded when they respond positively to them. And so consequently, she's actually pretty cool with unfamiliarity, um, which is really nice. Now, one of the things I did have to do, and this was not a training thing, this was a time and energy and budget thing, is that we tend to visit a lot of islands and islands are really finicky about letting dogs on because most of them don't have rabies, right? Everywhere we're visiting, they don't got no rabies. And we are bringing in place a, a dog from places that do. And there's a bunch of other diseases they don't have, their dogs don't have, and they understandably are really cautious about it. So every time I go on a cruise with this girl, or when, with Salem, I do the same thing, at the budget a few hundred extra dollars and a bunch of time because she has to go to the vet a few times she has to make sure she has every different country has a different set of requirements thank god the bahamas are basically like you should not actively be foaming at the mouth at this moment but like <laughs> yeah you know, like it's but like tortola man that was a whole nother thing and um you know when the the year we went to tortola and um so we, Turks and Caicos, we never made it there, but they had very specific requirements. And I had to, like, I had to get my dog vaccinated for stuff that they don't carry the vaccine for in Massachusetts, because why would they? Nobody gets that there, right? And so it was, um, and in irony, when I brought Salem on, I had to look all over the state for a vaccine for, I'm not making this up, coronavirus. <laughs> and at the time I was like, what the hell is coronavirus? Uh -huh. um, so anyway, we found it. Um, but the, uh, and then you have to send a bunch of, you have to overnight a bunch of papers to like Albany or wherever. And for the British Virgin Islands, so for Tortola, I literally had to mail her, well, the vet had to mail her blood to Kansas to make sure that her, her rabies titers were up to snuff. So you have to do a bunch of stuff to have the papers to be able to, to take the dog off, uh, on the boat and off the boat. So that is something that, um, you know, you can't just show up. Like, I know people who just showed up with their service dog in Hawaii, and you cannot do that. There's a quarantine program there. It goes very poorly um, if you did not plan to do that. So there's a lot of extra planning and things like that that go into it. But her training has generally been very good. I do want to talk a second about having a service dog in a pandemic. And the people I know who have been raising puppies during a pandemic, it is rough out there, no pun intended, but no, it is rough out there because you can't take them anywhere. Like for a long time, you couldn't take them anywhere. And you know, or you shouldn't, you know, like 
okay, I know a lot of puppy raisers in Georgia and people were going out anyway, but like that doesn't make it, make it a good idea, right? And there aren't as many experiences. There aren't as many people. It's not, you know, you're not getting them used to the crowds and stuff like that. And for those of us who- On the upside, they are all really, any fear they have of people in masks, no, nope. none of these no, dogs. We're all, good. all good with that. Yep, yep, that's a fact. Um, there is no way to explain to a working dog why she's not working anymore for a while. Well, we're not going out anywhere. Lockdown was absolutely necessary. I'm not complaining about the fact that we had lockdown, but uh, um, but it was very difficult to explain to the dog. Um, and I know of several um, service dog partnerships that did not survive the um, pandemic because your dog is is gonna have behavioral issues all of us our dogs had behavioral issues and when she says don't survive she just means that they had to retire yeah nobody's dead <laughs> i mean i mean like yes you know a million people are but nobody you know the dogs are fine the dogs are the dogs are good <laughs> and that's the part we really care about here so does uh, the dog die at the end no 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 okay. the dogs are fine the dogs are immortal. Yes, <laughs> the dogs are great, um, but the uh, you know the they're not behaving the way they were. They are not used to crowds anymore. They're not used to. She is having some trouble, and I mean I love her and she's amazing and we're going to be fine, but she is adjusting to being on this ship as much as I am, and I have you know I went a little feral for the past two years, so like. And we, we still go to the office sometimes and stuff like that, but we don't go many other places. She knows how to ride a bus. She knows how to go to the office. Eh, we're not doing a ton. We haven't been doing a ton of other stuff, right? So we get on here, there's a bunch of people. Everybody's very excited. There's like all kinds of costumes. Somebody, whoever was wearing the fox head the other night, I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It kind of blew her mind. She's kind of rude about it. <laughs> um, everybody whose tail she sniffed, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah. And, and the school, to their credit, knew that this was happening, checked in on all of us. And, and there's about 400 working teams right now out of my school. So, I mean, they checked on all of us. They sent out videos of stuff we could teach our dogs to do so they wouldn't, like, die of boredom during the time period. Most of which presumed that your dog was food motivated because most of the dogs are labs. My dog is not food motivated. I am still figuring out what motivates her. Um, so, yeah. Um, something else to sort of just think about with the pandemic. Yeah, so puppy raising was super hard yeah. um, because... You know, I, I have stopped puppy raising because I adopted Ryan and I decided I couldn't do both at the same time. But like, if I were to do it right now, I don't know what I'd do. Like, I, I don't go anywhere. I don't do anything. And it's not really wonderfully safe for me to do so. Um, and the other thing, um, when the lockdown happened, um, think for a moment of what that meant for the dogs who were in the um, prison program. Oh, yeah. Um, because um, a lot of those cases, the... Um, Trainers got calls from the prison saying, we are going into full lockdown, no one in or out. You have, you know, four, four hours to get your dogs out. Um, and then suddenly they were just like scattering puppies. Do you want a puppy? Yes, take the puppy. Yeah, everyone, everyone gets a puppy, you know. Yes. Um, and luckily everyone rallied and that worked out. But like, yeah, suddenly then people who were like, I was just supposed to have a dog on the weekend and now I have it full time. And now actually they gave me two what's going on um yes. but everything was crazy but. every staff member had a bunch of dogs in their house at the school and they actually got like what is it a hundred dogs out of their out of the kennels in two days because wow. because they had to lock down and um and everybody's okay i mean like all the dogs are okay all, all, all that's fun you know but like they had to do that and um so that was really hard and all of the trainers at school wound up taking home all the dogs they were training at that moment and you know trainers don't make a ton of money so they're in their tiny little long island apartment like with four with four very excited labrador retrievers and, and yeah <laughs> yeah Yeah, so, and I don't know if either of you would be able to speak to this, but I'm a very big advocate of, like, animal rescue and mm -hmm. 
not breeding and blah, blah, blah. Um, can you talk to the reasons why the guide dogs are not adopted versus why they are specifically bred? Yes. Um, there are service dog schools that do Repeat have- the question, please. Oh, I am so sorry. Can we talk to the, uh, can we talk about why the dogs are bred as opposed to adopted? Why the service dogs and the guide dogs are, um, you know, why, why they, why like rescue dogs aren't used and stuff like that. There are a few programs, uh, service dog programs that have used rescue dogs and shelter dogs and stuff like that. My honest answer is that they are really, really careful genetically about what they send out. And if they have a, um, they, they don't like surprises. And one of the things that happens, and I love rescue and I love shelter animals, I do, I absolutely do, but you do get surprises. And you do not always know what you're getting. You don't know if the history you got is accurate. Um, there's, there's a bunch of stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying that the, I'm not saying that the shelters lie, but you don't know if the people who dropped off the dog like told you the real deal or whatever. Um, also, there are a lot of dogs at the shelter that are, there's no breed restriction on what kind of, of on your service dog. Like if you get, if you have like a seizure alert dog or something, it's probably helpful if it's portable, but there are no guide chihuahuas, thank God. <laughs> and there's a lot of small dog, like the, Right now, rescues and shelters are full of small dogs and pit bull mixes. I don't have any problem with pit bull, uh, with pit bull mixes, but the small dogs do not guide so well. Um, and the, so that's, that's part of it. But really mostly it's, they are real strict about what they let out. Like all three of my dogs, one of the things that's a really huge moving target is food allergies, allergies in general. They tend to develop between ages two and four. At this point, the dog has already been put out there and is working. All three of my dogs have had some kind of food allergy. If it had been found before they graduated, they would have been released. Like they would not have gotten to, uh, they, they would not have gotten to work because hers are very easily controlled by just not feeding her certain things. But I have, there have, you don't know what you're getting with that. And there are dogs that are allergic to human dander. It is really hard to work those dogs. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, uh, that's part of it. Um, you don't know the history of, and you need this dog to be healthy consistently for seven years, right? So you know if there's something in their bloodline, if there's something in their bloodline that means that at age four they go blind, that is not suitable for the breeding lines of the dog. And I say this as somebody who is very, very deeply aware of the history of eugenics and disability rights and the things that it has done to my community and to blind people in particular. But I do get with the dogs, you don't want any surprises. And you get some anyway, right? Um, and the schools, they, they send each other little popsicles by, did you know you can send like dog, get frozen dog gametes by FedEx or whatever, you know, they, they have, they have breeding program exchanges and stuff like that. But like, it's, if a dog is, if it looks like their stuff develop, uh, developing in a line, they take that line out of the breeding pool. They make wonderful pets. They are great pets, um, but they're not used for bre breeding anymore. Does yeah, that so, explain somewhat? Thank you very yeah, much sure. for that answer. Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan was that situation, like I mentioned, you know, yeah. this genetic disease showed up in heart condition, showed up in the litter and like the whole litter got pulled to be tested and the parents were retired from the breeding program immediately. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's a numbers game in a lot of ways. Um, so it's like, so why are they Labradors and not Rottweilers or whatever they are? Um, yeah. You know, some of it is just once you've invested in your breeding program, and you yeah. tend to, you know, starting up another another breed is, is difficult. But there are, you know, German Shepherds and stuff like that out there. Yeah. Um, for Labrador Retrievers, um, the success rate, if you have had them from day one and you have set them up for success, is about 50%. So half of your dogs are going to go ahead yeah. and be placed in work. Um, 
Poodles are much um, lower. <laughs> poodles, I believe, are around 25%. If that. that. Yeah. If that. Um, they're necessary for situations like Rachel's where um, there's an allergic person in the system, um, and so you, you know, a Labrador is not reasonable for you. Um, you know, that's why they're not all poodles. Um, right. Also because then they would take over the world. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it might be a nice world to live in, honestly, so maybe I'm okay with pretty that. ready to leave the world to the poodles, not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, it takes about $50,000 to um, put a dog team um, on the on the out of the field. Um, so anything they can do to reduce their or to increase those numbers is great. Um, I have heard of situations where people do use um, shelter dogs and things like that, and that is for some of the specialty work where they haven't been able to identify the right genes. So like some of the specialized scent work, yeah. um, you can go. You just want a big group of dogs, and you do some tests, and you're like, okay, which of the dogs can even perceive this? Um, and then it's like, okay, since our set of dogs, not all of them can do the thing. That's it. It's worth it to try and work with those dogs. And I've heard of some groups that do that. Um, but yeah, a lot of them do have this breeding program just because they need to be able to set as much things up for success as they possibly can. And the breeding dogs are, I mean, this may go without saying, but they're pretty happy. Um, you know, they actually, the standards for a breeding dog are higher than the standards for a service dog, and the standards for a service dog are pretty high. Um, her dad um, has retired and li is living happily in the mountains of North Carolina right now, but spent most of his life on Long Island. Um, and, you know, he came in periodically when he was called upon to do the thing. And the, the girl dogs, they go in when they're, when they're in heat, you know, and there's very strict rules around, you know, who's allowed to have access to the dogs when, when they're in heat or whatever. And um, they, the girls work until, well, they're, they never, the girls never have more than one litter per year. They, um, the oldest they're allowed to, to get, uh, to breed at is, I want to say they're retired at seven. The boys retire at 10. Um, they have surgery, you know, I mean, that's how, you know, and then, um, but they're, they're great. And if it looks like they're having trouble, they're not, they don't have to breed. Like, uh, Brody's mom had two litters. And the second litter was Bro it was the one Brody was in, and apparently it was a little rough on her. And they were like, you know what? You don't ever have to do that again. Um, and that was fine. Um, so it's you know they they take very 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 good care of them. The rest of the time, while they keep their training up, you know, and their house manners up, you know, they go to obedience classes and stuff. But they are they are treasured pets. Um, the rest of the time, um, and they are. They're pretty happy with their their lives, so it's not like this is not like puppy mill stuff. Um, incidentally, um, if you are if you are intrigued about anything we're talking about and are thinking sort of in the back of your mind that you might want to volunteer, or, yeah, or something like that. So there's wherever there's lots of different schools across the United States, so you just find one um, specific to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, some things to sort of know this is if you are doing the puppy raising thing, are you allowed to adopt if they fail? Yeah. Um, that, is a, that is something that changes between different schools. Yes. How much are they paying versus how much are you paying? Anything you're paying, like for food and stuff like that, you can deduct under taxes. Can you tell I think about taxes a lot? Um, but, um, so, um, but you know, just sort of be aware of all that, whether your obligations in terms of you know, training time and stuff like that. Um, there's always a very, specific manual of ways that you have to train the dog, whether they're allowed to do, um, you know, they're not allowed on furniture. <laughs> it's like, I actually bought like a futon to put on my ground because I could not sit on the floor to cuddle my dog <laughs> without my back hurting. We have um, a cuddling chair. Yeah, so um, uh, if the puppy thing seems like too much for you and um, that sort of training is too much for you, they also look for hosts for um, breeders. Um, so, and that usually does come with a, once they are done um, with their breeding life, you are um, expected, it is assumed, you are not required, it is assumed that you will adopt the dog. Um, so like that could be another way to participate that might be a little better for your lifestyle. I was thinking about that at some point. It's like, if I want a second dog, maybe that's a good way of doing it. Different schools also differ in whether or not you have, con if you are a puppy raiser, you have contact with the dog when it graduates. Yeah. I don't think the seeing eye gets to talk to their puppy raisers, um, and that's that's how they do it. That's just their way of doing it, you know. 
um, GDF, make, our school, makes sure that they are, um, that everybody consents, right? You have a three month no contact right after graduation. You do get to come to graduation if you want. Um, and, uh, you know, if, you're, if your dog is graduating and stuff, you get to, uh, but like then you and the, and the handler decide if you want to have contact, uh, contact again after that. Um, and, and it's arranged to the school. So it's arranged like, to if you school. want to say no, then yeah, the other you don't have to say that to somebody. You know, yeah. You're you, not like, Thank you for my dog. Go away. Yeah, right. It's like they, they do it all free. Right, right. Absolutely. And um, now this is with, with the advent of uh, social media, this is a little harder to do because her puppy raiser and I were already Facebook friends um, <laughs> when I got her. And so like this, this no contact for three months thing, we we're like, yeah, forget it. <laughs> also, this thing where you can't, shouldn't technically say who your dog is until graduation and can't, because it has been known to happen that the match doesn't work that well or something goes wrong in class and you have to they have to switch out dogs. Um, so you know, sort of going on social media and being like, I have Echo. You know, in my case, if I if they had needed to switch out the dog, they would have had to send me home because they don't have that many poodles available at a time. But uh, if you have a lab. And you have fairly basic needs, like you don't have some sort of weird exotic thing that you do, like, you know, I am, you know, I fly 18 times a week, or, you know, I am on a boat most of the time, or something like that. Like, they can probably find, find you something, but um, matching is a little bit art, a little bit science, and a little bit magic, as far as I can tell. And they know... The school knows more about me than the federal government do does, and I was an employee of the Department of Justice for two years. So um, the they they have you know the application process involves an interview, it involves uh, a video or a home visit where they see you walking around. They know my gait, they know my speed, uh, they know what kind of uh, they know that I take public transit on a regular basis that I go into the city a lot um, That I do not live with other animals, but as of last week I live with a baby So that's gonna be new. I've never had to put that on my application before my roommate my my, my roommates had a baby last uh, last week um, It's been a heck of a How month. is Echo feeling about that? She loves kids and we went, so the kid, the kid came home after we left, but we did go visit it in the hospital, her in the hospital. And, um, and, uh, Echo was ecstatic to meet her and, uh, was, was, was very concerned to see my roommate in a hospital bed because Echo has figured out what hospitals are for. Um, and so she's, are, are you okay? <laughs> and, you know, my roommate who had just had, you know, a very long labor and then a c-section was okay you know she was good she was happy but a little down for the count and so yeah it went fine i believe it's going to go continue to go fine i think it will also and you know i love all my dogs so much but i think it will go much better with echo than it would with salem who also loves children but barks a lot and Echo is less barky and so is less likely to wake the child, um, who apparently is waking just fine all on her own. Do we have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, um, this is less relevant for the guide dog, but I've heard a lot of stories about service dogs alerting to other people. Um, so if, if it's something related to a medical condition or to emotional condition, that you'll be walking past someone and the dog will just like walk right up to someone else and alert. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. So the question I think was... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, do dogs that do service dogs that alert for things sometimes alert for people who wind up walking up and alerting for uh, on people who are not their person? Like, you know, just walking through like all of a sudden and they see it and there's a person and they, they do their thing, right? Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've never had to train for that. My understanding is how that works is, um, in general, that means that their person is unconscious. Um, you know, in general, they're, they're there to help you do your thing. And maybe the thing that they're doing is like helping you find a place to pass out because they can tell that you're about to. Um, but a certain amount of like, oh, you think not? I, I'm thinking like if it's a seizure alert dog uh -huh. and it 
goes up to somebody else and alerts that they're about to have a seizure, <laughs> and they are, that kind of thing, or like a blood sugar alert, no, yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. That's what I was thinking. That, yeah. yeah, so it's like, a, does it, not that the dog is walking around loose and alerting, but that the, um, that the dog is walking with its handler and discovers somebody else who may be, who, and alerts to the thing on somebody else who is about to have the thing happen. Yeah, that, is that how it works? That seems strange to me, because of course the dog would first tell their person. And yes. Um, so the person would presumably reach so, out unless they weren't able to. I feel like if you got people sitting around in your living room, which people used to do back in the day, who knew, right? <laughs> but like, if you got people sitting around in your living room and your dog is like hanging out, right? And they alert to somebody, about, uh, and they alert to like one of your buddies who's sitting there. Like I could see that happening, but I don't know. I don't know much about it. I know that this girl has a real instinct for when people are in trouble or upset, which is not her job. <laughs> but we have been to a number of hospitals. We have been to nursing homes. We've been to like rehab places. And she is very concerned about the people who are making unhappy noises about the people who you know seem to be in distress um i do know that uh at one point we were waiting in the er for a friend of ours to get out of the er and we were in the waiting room and there was a woman sitting there sobbing and echo just walked up to her and went <laughs> and the woman stopped sobbing and was like hello <laughs> um so they have i mean dogs have a good instinct for that but i I don't know. I don't think either of us has ever had a dog that was trained to alert to things. So I yeah. think we know less about that. Yeah, the way I understand it, and I'll get your question in a second, um, is, yeah, the, the handler is incapacitated. And in that case, the dog has been trained to go find someone. So right. if you were yeah. on the receiving end of that, if you ever see a dog come up to you and stop and stare at you and then like walk back a little bit and look at you again, they are trying, you know, if you, Someone, a service dog, you know, yeah. is trying to guide you somewhere. Please do that. You're probably going to find their handler at the other end and yeah. make reasonable decisions based on that. Um, don't touch them. Yeah. Um, just let them do their job. Yeah. Sorry, what's the question? Um, I've actually had three service dogs alert to panic attacks for me. Um, so I can say that service dogs who are medical alert dogs will alert to strangers. Oh, they will alert to strangers. Yeah. Okay, okay. Interesting. They'll alert and they'll do the tasks they're trained to do. So alert to strangers before they alert you, or? Um, no, they'll alert, so three service dogs that I didn't know at the time um, alerted to me when I was about to have a panic attack uh -huh. and did the task, you know, of course with my consent and the handler's consent. Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll alert and without a second thought. So okay. you were the stranger? I w uh, yeah, I was the stranger. Right. Oh, and so you were, yeah. so you were having the thing, the yeah. thing that they were trained to alert to was something that was going on with you. Right. Yeah. But not with their handler at that, that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I was the stranger. So it was not that they were trying to elicit help from you for their person. That was yeah. thing. Okay, we got another question. Additional insight. I have a friend who has a diabetic alert dog, mm -hmm. and uh, he has also um, alerted, not often, but it has happened where he has done his task to say like, hey, you're, you have high blood sugar right now, <laughs> and to someone else, and she, uh, the handler would joke like, oh, maybe you have high blood sugar, because he was off at that point. He wasn't right. actively working. He didn't have his vest on, but he still was trained to alert even with his vest off, um, just because he could smell it. And yeah, he would go up to, he went up to somebody when he wasn't working, booped them, and she joked, oh, maybe you have high blood sugar. Sure enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, to repeat the anecdote, yeah, so there was um, diabetic alert dogs who alert on people other than their handler um, when their blood sugar is high. And yep, they're right, they're good at that. Yeah. <laughs> I have no have concept left? of what time it is. Yeah. No, it's 12.25. 12 12.25, so it's about that time. We're good. Okay, do um, we want I, to call it and possibly see? She's snoozing now. I know frequently you end this thing. Oh, no. no. <laughs> I, I ruined everything. Um, so, yeah, I will take her off duty and she can say hi to people. Also, I want to give a shout out to my friend Diana, who is on this cruise and is amazing and made now. 
I have a limited number of these, but made poodle posse pins. Oh my god! Oh. Oh my god. Now I and there are I think few enough people that were uh, here that, that that were good, but I also want to have them available for her office hours, which are by the way on Thursday. 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 Um, she has office hours on Thursday, at which point she will be frolicking and playing with people. Um, she will definitely be playing on the beach at Half Moon Key because, um, like, she loves the beach. But then she will be sandy and disgusting. <laughs> and then she will try to get on the bed. Um, so, uh, but... Side-eye right now. Oh, she was born giving side-eye. I have picture. Poodles are the... the the masters are sorry. I have a picture of her giving Sada at six weeks old. Um, nobody judges like a poodle. At one point, I wanted to start up a Tumblr that was just pictures of poodle is judging you. Um, but yes. So hey, Echo, come here. Okay. You wanna Almost. you wanna say hi to people? Moving forward. Good girl. I, I'm trying to take your damn thing off. Come on. <laughs> Oh, That's a very cute harness. Thanks. I did not make it. <laughs> um, oh, fun fact. I own the dog. I don't own the harness. The school owns the harness. Oh, wow. I have to give it back when she retires. There is a an underground market of harnesses because people try to fake things. And, do uh, and schools are occasionally checking eBay for their harnesses reappearing there because people are terrible. And um, yes. Yeah, you got Auntie Molly. I haven't seen you in like two years. I just it's true. That's I have actually never met Ryan. I just am in love with him, but like I have never met him. So we need to fix that. Yeah, we really do. They would. It turns out she is an excellent guest and a really crappy host because she is absolutely an alpha dog and will get in your face and bark forever if you're in her in, in her in her yard. But like she does great in other people's yards. Um, so yes, I have here a dog. I did give her a bath treat. It may not have made any difference whatsoever. And I have some pins. And um, if people also, you know, people are also welcome to come to her office hours. And uh, tomorrow I'm also doing uh, the the Joko Crip and Spo and Sea Spoonie uh, get together. So please feel free to show up to that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Just stop, need some love. Get up here. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Twist my arm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Say hi to everybody. Hi, Of course you can have a pin. Yes, you can totally have a pin. Have a pin.